you, church. That good, huh? All right, well, it's about to get better. Yeah. <laughs> Who's ready for worship? All right, let's stand up on our feet. Let's worship the Lord. Let's begin with a little bit of prayer this morning. All right. Hey, if you got if you got something, I was talking to the Lord this morning, and he said, he said, Jason, make an opportunity for burdens. Um, because I want people to know I carry them. So during this prayer, if you got a burden you're carrying, if you got something you can't figure out, something that's uh, that's kind of looming, or something that you're just afraid of stepping into, right now, would you just lift it up to him? Tell him exactly what it is right now as I pray. Jesus, you are a protector, author and for perfecter of our faith, the example that we have. And so we worship you for things that you haven't even done yet, God, because you're faithful. So we thank you for all that you are. We thank you for the strength, for the peace that you give, that you are the foundation that we are able to stand on, not ourselves. So God, we bring you everything. We bring you our joys. We bring you our concerns, knowing that you're faithful with it. You are the God that we worship. You are worthy. Oh, you're worthy of every breath, every song, and every word. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's worship. Sing it out, there were walls, there were walls between us, by the cross you came and broke them down, you broke them down, there were chains around us, by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound, you called me out, you called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, feel the darkness shaking, come on. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life, oh, back to life. And hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger.
and amen. If you come to worship this morning and you're broken, remember we praise a God who is perfect in mending and healing. So may this not just be words on our lips. May it be our hearts cry that he would come in and make whole what is lost and what is broken. Oh, raise him up. Lift Jesus up.
God is the God we worship. Amen. Church, you may be seated. All right, I want to welcome you to First Methodist Church, Midlothian. What a joy it is to gather here as God's people, uh, to gather to witness to the good news of Jesus Christ and all that God has done through him to bring us hope, to bring us life, and, and to bring uh, joy to the world. So we're grateful to gather here and thankful for the chance uh, to come together. I'm thankful you've come. And if you're a guest, we're so glad you chose to be with us here today. Um, Pastor Brady Johnston, and just want to welcome you. So uh, we'll I know a lot of people have asked for updates on my family, so uh, both my wife and my dad had major surgeries within eight days of each other in the last few weeks, and so it's been, uh, my house has been dubbed the Johnston Clinic, so that's, everybody's doing well, my dad's back home and and recovering and feeling better, and my wife is also at home recovering, and so we're grateful for your prayers and your food and your love and all those things, and so we really appreciate it and grateful everyone's doing well, so um, we're invite our kids to come up front to meet me for a blessing as you get ready for godly play y'all come on come on up all right well it's good to see y'all today all right y'all ready for this all right well we're so excited that you have the chance to go and hear god's word and what the lord is going to say to you through these amazing stories of his love and his grace that are given to us and so let's have a prayer together can y'all put your hands together and let's, let's pray, okay. God, we are so thankful for our children. And we are grateful that you love our children even more than we do. And God, you are pleased to be with them when they gather to hear the stories. May your love, may your grace be real. And may they know it in their hearts and in their lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all go with Miss Keely over here. Church, as we continue in our worship, let's keep our eyes focused on Him. You're invited if you need to. If you need to come up to the altar rails, uh, please do. If you want to stay seated, you can do that. And if you want to stand and sing, you can do that. This is your time to be with Him. So let's sing these words of truth. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Sing, Lord, I need you. Sing him out. 
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Yes, we do. Church, let's gather together. Let's pray. Lord, we do raise you up. And we do acknowledge our need. That we were lost. We were broken by our own doing. We don't claim anybody else's fault. It's ours. We chose the steps. And yet in your grace, you still call to us. That's our story. We get to claim that. We are not lost. We are not cast out. It doesn't matter what our past is. You don't care. You just want us close. And so you did everything necessary. Fulfilled every judgment. Took every wrath. All punishment was cast upon you and your innocence. And we are forever grateful. We will eternally worship your name. For you are worthy, the lamb that was slain, the lamb that overcame. So God, we sit in your presence, knowing that truth is here, healing is here, our life is here. So God, do as you promise, and that when we are gathered, you will be here with us. You will come and make all things new. So church, together we say we surrender. We surrender to you, Jesus. Oh, we need you. And we pray this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. (laughs) Amen. Amen. I invite you, if you have your your Bible, to turn with me to Joshua chapter 4. Before we get into the scripture, I want to just provide a little bit of context. We're now in week 4 of this sermon series of walking through the first six chapters of Joshua, and we find that God's people have been in the wilderness for 40 years, and they're preparing to enter the land that God has promised them. And there is one thing that remains in their way, and that's the Jordan River. And so God calls them to prepare to cross the Jordan. And when the community gets ready to go, they come to the banks of the Jordan to find out that the river is at flood stage. It's before the harvest season, and so the rains have come. And so this is the worst time of year for them to make this crossing. And if you could just imagine with me for a moment what it would be like to sense and to feel and to to know that God has commanded you to move through this river, and yet you find the waters just raging out of control. I can only imagine the sense of, of fear and intimidation they felt there. Um, in fact, God calls the priests to actually step into the waters of the Jordan, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbol of God's power and presence in the world. 
he calls them to actually put their feet into the waters. And, that, and, and as they do, and I just can only imagine the kind of faith it would take to do that. And yet they did. They, they, they stepped into the waters believing that God would do something great if they trusted him. And sure enough, the moment the priests put their feet into the waters, the waters of the Jordan River stopped. And the community, they made their way through the rivers on, through the river on dry ground. It's incredible. And we find here in Joshua 4, in our scripture today, that as the community is making their way across the river, that God gives them a specific command. And it's, it's fascinating when we stop to look at it. And so I, I want us to turn our attention to Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Um, this is the word of God um, for us, God's people. And so let's, let's hear. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, and according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did just as Joshua commanded them. They took up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, as we think about our lives, I think we can look back and reflect upon our experience and kind of think of these moments when our lives were changed. Where whether it was a decision or a circumstance, something that happened in your life, um, everything was kind of different from that point. Your life took a different trajectory because of this moment in in time for me that story of when everything in my life changed took place when I was 15 years old 15 something happened in my life that was was so profound that, that like my life would never be the same and, and I'll tell you that story at the end of the sermon but first, I want to turn our attention to the Scriptures because I think this has something to do to set up what we need to hear. We, we find the community at this interesting point as they're moving through the Jordan River on, on dry ground when God gives them the command to take up 12 stones from the middle of the river and to carry them across the river and to set them up at the camp where they would stay that night. And, and it's clear that Joshua, the leader of the Israelites, is to set these stones up and that these stones are to be a memorial to what God had done for his people. They were to be a, a monument, essentially, to the faithfulness of God. A testament to his power and capacity to move on behalf of his people. An incredible thing. When I was studying this week and kind of actually a few months ago, looking through Joshua and trying to get prepared for this series, I was reading through the first six chapters and I got to chapter four and I got about halfway through chapter four and I have to tell you this, it's like a confession, uh, 
I, I thought, yeah, this, this isn't really sermon worthy. And I thought, well, we'll just kind of brush over uh, Joshua chapter 4 and this command to set up the stones. And it wasn't until I got through with the chapter that I realized that Joshua spends the entire chapter on this command for them to set up the stones as a memorial to what he had done. And I thought, well, Joshua thinks this is important. And Joshua, if Joshua thinks this is important, then we maybe should take a second look at this and see how this might be important for us. And a little further look in prayer, and I, I believe this is a word not only for the people in that moment in time, I think it's a word for us. And I think we see that as we begin to look deeper into the chapter and as we even ask the question, you know, why is it important that the people took the stones from the middle of the river and set them up as a, as a, a memorial, as a, as a monument to God's faithfulness? It's a fair question to ask in this. And I think the chapter gives us two reasons, kind of two purposes behind this command for them to set up the stones. And the first one is that they are to set up the stones as a way to remember the story. That the monument that they set up at their camp would be a, like a visible reminder of what God had done for them. A visible reminder of God's faithfulness and how they had experienced God's faithfulness at a time when they needed God to show up in their life. And they set these stones up in a way that it almost assumes that they're going to revisit them. That whether they happen upon them because they're traveling through the region or whether or not they actually make an intentional journey to go and see the stones, the, the assumption is, is that they're going to come across these stones again. And that when they did, they would go back to the moment in time of that experience. That they would begin to think about, oh, I remember what it was like to walk up to hear the command of God to move across the river, and yet we walked up to the river and we saw the river just raging. And I had that pit in my stomach thinking there's no way we can cross something like this. And then we saw God move in power. And it's remembering. Like remembering that story as they see the stones and they remember the story that they, they go, oh my, like their confidence in God just begins to grow. You know, this is set up in a way to, to call them to, to remember what God had done, to remember his faithfulness. And I bring this point up because I believe um, that we too should stack our own stones. That we too should set up our own memorials or monuments. And here's what I mean by that. Like the people in this story, we all have stories of how we too have experienced God's faithfulness. As you look back on your life, maybe those pivotal stories I mentioned briefly in the beginning, we can think of times when we experience the love and the mercy and the grace of God. We can think of times when, when God moved in ways beyond our expectation or, or imagination. And maybe for you it was when you had a relationship that you valued but you felt was lost, was broken, and yet God restored through forgiveness and reconciliation. Maybe for you, it was a season in your life or time in your life when you were like the lost sheep, but you experienced the grace of the good shepherd who pursued you and found you. Like we think back on our lives and we have stories. Stories that point to the faithfulness of God and his love and his commitment to us to be present and at work in our lives. And I think just like the people here, there is value in, in us setting up monuments, these stories of how God has moved so faithfully in our lives. Especially ones that we can revisit time and time again. 
And, and here's why I, I think it's important. I think it's important for us to set up these monuments and remember these stories that, of how God has faithfully moved in our lives because there is no greater way to trust God in the present than by remembering what he has done in our past. Like the surest way to have trust and faith in God's faithfulness today in your life the surest way to do that is to remember God's faithfulness in the past. It's the quickest way to build your confidence and trust in the Lord. I have no doubt, and Joshua alludes to it even before we get to chapter 4, that as the people are being prepared to move into a flooded river, there was one place their mind went back to. And it was a story that they'd heard from their ancestors of when they stood before a body of water that they could not move. And God in his power and mercy, like he parts the Red Sea, and the people walk on dry land to freedom. And as they remember that story, their confidence in God grew. They went back to that that monument, that memorial of what God had done in their history, and they said, God, if you did it once, you can do it again, so we'll step into the waters trusting you. To be today who you were for those who came before us. And they watched God do something great because they believed and they trusted. Now the surest way for for you to, to grow your confidence in God's faithfulness for your life today is to look back and remember his faithfulness and how he's been faithful in your past. And I say that because look, some of you you may feel like God is calling you to something today or, or there's a circumstance where you need to trust him and it feels a lot like stepping into some flooded waters. And so it helps to go back and remember that if you want the courage to take that step, to remember how God has been with you and been present and moved in your life before, There's something else here about remembering that's, that's, that's worth speaking to here in this story, and we actually didn't quite get to it in our reading today. Uh, there's actually two sets of stones that are, that are set up here in this story. Uh, there's the one we read about where, where Joshua, the people take the 12 stones and they set those up at, at the camp that night. But there's another uh, monument that Joshua sets up, and it's actually in the Jordan River. He goes to the feet of the priests who are standing there with the Ark of the Covenant and he, he sets up a, a memorial there, right in the middle of the river. And what's interesting about that is that most of the time, the people wouldn't be able to see that, that memorial. They wouldn't see the stones. I mean, the Jordan River has a pretty healthy rate of flow of water most of the year. And so most of the year, they would just not, that, that wouldn't even be visible to them. It would be covered by the waters. And, and the Jordan River would, would, you know, rise and fall like most rivers would based upon the seasons. But it would only be when the river was at its lowest point that they would be able to see the second set of memorial stones. And I bring that up because we know that life sometimes is full of low points. We do. You, you live enough life, you know that there's going to be some low points. And when you hit one of those low points, boy, it sure is nice to have another set of memorial stones to visit, isn't it? Lived enough life, man, you know that life ebbs and flows. There's high points and there's low points. And you can't build up enough stories of God's faithfulness to go back to, to nourish you and give you hope and encouragement for the future. You know, I can just imagine in those low points as the people go back that you revisit those stories and you remember, God, you were faithful not only once, but as I look back on my life, God, you were faithful again and again and again, and 
when you begin to stack enough of those stories together of how God has been with you in those moments you thought you were lost, you thought you were without hope, you, you begin to realize, God, if you were faithful so many times in my past, surely, God, you're going to be faithful to me today. Surely you're enough for me today. Surely you love me as much today as you love me then, and you'll be pleased to move in my life again and see me beyond the moment that feels like it's just too much for me. You know, the people are, are to stack the stones as monuments to God's faithfulness to remember the story, to remember how they experienced his faithfulness. The second purpose behind the stacking of the stones is that the stones are to be there to help them tell the story. They're a visible reminder for the people to tell the story of what they've experienced. And, and what's interesting here about this is that as important as it is for the stones to serve a purpose for them to remember how they experience God's faithfulness, it is even more important that they tell the story of God's faithfulness to those who didn't experience it. That's what the Lord says in, in verses 6 and 7. It's the chief purpose of the stones is he says, in the future, when your children ask you, those who didn't walk across the river, when they see the stones and they ask you, what do these stones mean? He says, tell them. Tell them the story. The flow of the Jordan River was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when we crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. These stones were to be a reminder to tell the story of God's faithfulness. And when you read Joshua 4, you, you can't miss that part. In fact, the story of what God does for the people is told and then retold and then told again. In fact, if you read all of Joshua 4, if you use our Waypoint, our weekly devotional resource that you can get before you leave, um, you'll go through the whole chapter. And if you read it, and this is maybe a good exercise for you, just read all of Joshua 4 in one setting, and you'll find that this is arranged in a rather peculiar way. Like it's not read to where it, it reads easily. Um, it, the story happens and they recall it and then it continues and then it, they, they recall the story again. And it's a rather awkward way of telling the story. But the reason that it's told and retold and remembered and, re and told again is because they want you to tell the story. That's how important it is for you to tell the story of how you experience God's faithfulness. And as I read that this week, the, the, the question that just came out to my mind was like, like, God, how good it we are telling, are we at telling our stories? Of telling our stories of how we have experienced your faithfulness. God says, I mean, tell your children. They need to hear it. And I hold that question in front of us. Like, how good are we at sharing our story? All the things that are going through your mind of the events in which God did something great in your life, maybe brought healing to your own heart, your spiritual renewal and hope and peace where you, you didn't have it before, whatever it might be. Like, have you shared those stories? Have you told those stories to your kids if you have them or grandkids? Your friends know the story. You know, if we want to be a church that, that seeks to do our part of helping raise up disciples, people who follow Jesus, we have to tell our stories. If we want to be a church that, that seeks to reach new people for Christ, we have to tell our stories. Of when the love of Christ became real to us. 
became more than just a story you heard someone else tell, but became real to you. Of the time when God's grace was just poured out lavishly upon you. Of when a prayer was answered. And we have to be willing to tell our stories. And this is where I'll share with you my story, um, the story of how my life changed when I was 15. Um, it started with a seizure that was rather unexpected. Uh, after a seizure, I went and got some tests and scans done at the hospital and uh, found myself sitting in doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment until finally one day the doctor said something I was not prepared to hear when he said, you have a brain tumor. And I don't know that you can ever be ready to hear that in your life, uh, but let me tell you, you're certainly not ready for it at 15. And the doctor, the neurologist, said, I, it looks like it's cancerous, but we need to know for sure, and we're going to make an appointment for you at Dallas Children's Medical. They have the, the testing equipment there that will be able to help us determine without doing a biopsy of what we think this might be. And so they set up an appointment for me, um, and it was four weeks from hearing those words to my next appointment. Four weeks. That is a long time to sit in such uncertainty. I was fortunate to have a great family and great friends and a great church, and they, man, they did the best job they could at rallying to come alongside me. Um, but I can only describe those weeks in between as feeling a crushing sense of isolation. Anybody's efforts to come alongside me just fell short uh, of the despair that I felt. And as I waited and waited, I spiraled more and more out of control, struggling to eat, crying myself to sleep every night. And I'll never forget one evening when I hit just my breaking point where I just knew I, I couldn't, couldn't do this anymore. Couldn't do life if life was going to be like this. Didn't want to do life if life was going to be like this. I've been fortunate my whole life to be surrounded by people who believed in God, and I believed in God for most of my life as much as I can remember. But it wasn't until that moment of pure desperation that I knew how much I needed God. And at my lowest point, I prayed the only prayer I could muster at that time. It wasn't fancy. I said, Lord, help me. I need you. That's all I could pray. And I'm nearly 30 years removed from that moment in time, and I still don't have the words to describe what happened after that. I felt a flood of God's presence in my life that I'd never felt before. And where there had been peace and hopelessness, where there had been a lack of peace and hopelessness, God, there was just, there was just peace. That peace that Paul says surpasses understanding. It doesn't make sense in light of what you're going through. It just covered me. A week later, I went up to Dallas and made that trip to have more tests run and to meet with a specialist and did all the tests with the scans and the contrast to see the tumor and to us to know what we're dealing with here. And I sat down in the appointment to kind of hear what the next steps were, what surgeries, what, what might need to happen and what next steps for treatment. The doctor walked in with a few sets of scans and he put up the first set of scans that had been done with contrast and to highlight any abnormalities. And they threw the scans up there, and it's so clear a child could tell you where the tumor was. And, and he asked where the tumor, and we saw it and pointed it out, and then he put up the second set of scans, the one I'd done the days before. And he said, I want you to tell me where the tumor is. And my family and I, we looked and looked and couldn't see it. It wasn't clear. And we said, we don't see anything. And he said, neither do we. It's gone. He said, I have several sets of scans that show a tumor three weeks ago. 
And I have two here that show there's nothing. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, we knew. My family and I knew. That God had not only brought emotional and spiritual healing that I needed in my life, but physical healing. And as I think back on that story, I think back on that moment in my life, you know, I think about it, and, and, and there was so much uh, I needed, and there were so many amazing things that, that happened. And I think often we hear this story, and people think they get the, the, the miraculous healing part stands out, and it is amazing. It's incredible to have experienced something like that. Not everybody gets that, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for it. But the part that stands out to me nearly 30 years later Is the fact that the moment, from that moment I prayed that prayer, I have never felt alone since. I've never felt alone. Not one time in 30 years have I ever felt alone since that moment where I just felt so, so alone. And I think about this, and, and I, I tell you this story today because maybe for some of you, you needed to hear that. Maybe for you, a sense of isolation or feeling alone. You're the only person who understands what you're going through and no one else can, can come and touch that. Like maybe that's where you are. And to hear a story about a God who loves you and moves and hears your prayers and seeks to be present with you, even in the sense of isolation, and can overcome that and give you peace where there is no peace before, maybe you need to hear that in your life. And you're getting a real sense of, of the power of a sharing a story of experiencing God's faithfulness. I know some of you have your own stories. In church, we need to tell our stories. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus is looking at the soon-to-be church, Jesus says, you'll go and you'll be my witnesses in the world. And I realize the word witness scares a lot of us, but, but by Jesus' definition, a witness is someone who shares what they've seen, heard, and experienced of him. That's it. Not preach a sermon. Not stand on a street corner and yell at anybody. It's go tell the stories of what you've seen, heard, and experienced of me. And I put this here in Joshua 4 because tr we have stories. Like chances are just in, in listening to this, you've already started to build some monuments of the stories that you've experienced God's faithfulness in your life. And that's great. And if you haven't had the time to do that, then spend some time afterwards doing it. Build those monuments so that you not only can go back to them in the times that you need the encouragement to be reminded that God has been faithful and will be faithful no matter what you're going through. But also that you can share the gift of those stories so that when someone in your life says, I'm going through a hard time and I don't know, man, maybe my wife and I were heading to divorce, maybe it's all over, you can look at your monument and say, man, I was there. We were there and we were struggling. We finally cried out to God and God moved in amazing ways in my life and what he's done for us, he will do for you. We call on him. Maybe someone says, man, I'm struggling with my kid. Man, they just... They're going through something and I can't be there as a parent and I feel hopeless and helpless. And maybe you can say, man, I remember being there and I remember seeing God show up at some of the worst moments. Man, can I pray with you? Man, you have your stories. I know you do. I know some of your stories. My encouragement to you out of Joshua 4 is, is be intentional about stacking up your monuments to God's faithfulness, the way you've experienced God's faithfulness in your life, and then just be open. Say, God, show me who I can share the story with. Maybe my kids or my grandkids, they need to hear the story. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's someone I haven't met yet. And the door, man, the Holy Spirit just opens the door for me to just share my experience. I don't have to preach at them. I can just share, God, what you've done in my life and let you take it from there. And church, I, I think 
as much as it may intimidate us to tell the story, we, we need to hear God say to us, we have to tell our stories. And so as we respond to God in prayer, um, I want to invite you, if, if you feel a sense of maybe conviction in your life, um, maybe for you it looks like a couple different things. It could look like you saying, um, I need to set up my monuments of remembering God's faithfulness in my past because I need the strength from that today. I need to remember with what I'm going through today that God has been faithful and he will be faithful. And so maybe for you, that coming down to pray might be a chance to do that and remember. Maybe for you, it's building these monuments because you, you have people in your life who need to hear the story. The story of a God who loves so deeply and passionately that he pursues us and moves in our lives. And that we need the courage to say, Lord, would you guide me, my words and opportunities to give glory to you by sharing the story. This is a time for us to respond in prayer. and We'll pray together as a church. And if you feel a sense of conviction and maybe you want to come down and kneel at the altars, you know, the altars are... are, are they're a symbol, and in, in the Bible, uh, the altar was often a, a footstool of, of God, where, where God, heaven meets earth. And so it just kind of stands, I think, to us as a symbol of a place where God meets us. And for me, I think it's a place where, uh, I don't know, let's be honest, it's a little scary sometimes to come up here. You think, what are people thinking behind me and what's going on in my life? It doesn't matter. Um, but if you feel like, man, God, maybe you're calling me to share my story, and I'm, I'm nervous, I don't know who or how to do it, maybe this is a place your first step in faith is just to come up here and say, God, all right, <laughs> I'll obey you, and I ob- will obey you because I believe you'll do great things if I just say yes and have the courage to say yes to tell my story. And so we're going to pray. If you want to come down and, and pray at the altars, I invite you to do that now. You can pray in your seats. There's nothing wrong with that but if you want to respond that way uh, we invite you to come down and and to pray here but let's be a church that says yes we'll tell our stories god you've done great things we we want to we want to brag on you to other people because you you you're just so good so let's turn to him in prayer god we are so thankful so thankful that we can look back on our lives and see the ways in which you have moved God, we have all felt that pit in our stomach, facing a circumstance or a decision that's just too much for us, that seems like there's no way forward, and yet, God, you made a way. Seasons in which, God, you showed up amidst our prayers of desperation. Times you gave peace when it didn't make sense to have peace. Times you brought restoration to things we thought were too broken to be mended. God, we give you thanks for the ways in which we've experienced your faithfulness. We give you praise, and there is no better way to express our gratitude than to tell the story. And for some of us, God, that intimidates us, scares us to death to think of putting words to our experiences and sharing them with another person. But we pray, God, that that you would give us a sense of boldness and courage. Help us to understand that the world around us, like like they're ready for these stories. They want to know that, that, that a God who meets us in isolation will meet them in their sense of isolation. That a God who, who can give hope to one can give hope to another. That a God who rescues and saves one from the pit, he wants to do that for them. So give us the courage to say yes and to trust you that you'll provide the words and the opportunities if we just put that one foot in front of the other in obedience to you. We pray this, that our lives would be an offering and a gift that others may know who you are, what you can do, and what you want to do in their lives. Amen. Would you stand and would you sing? Would you sing this with me? Oh, this is my story. 
This is my song, praising my Savior, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior, praising my Savior. my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me shaking I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus cause he's never Faithful through generations, so I would he fail now. He won't. Yeah. No, he won't. No, he won't. Yeah. My Jesus, yeah. sing. I've still got joy. That he never fails. We can trust him. Amen, church. Come on, sing Rain Came.
Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I want to thank you for being here today. What a, what a great day to come and worship our God. Um, grateful you're here. If you're a first time guest, we're so glad you came. We have a gift for you. Miss Valerie's in a wave. Uh, you'll want to see her before you go. Trust me. Trust me on that one. So uh, she has something for you. We're thankful that you came. Uh, just a couple of announcements. One of those is tonight we have Discover Grace from 5 to 7, a kind of family-friendly worship service. Uh, we'll be in here and um, kind of great time to let kids be kids and just to have fun uh, being together. A great way for parents and grandparents to invest in the next generation. Um, so I invite you to come for, for that. We also have coming up on the February 11th, we have our Super Bowl chili cook-off. So the... This is a great way for those of us Cowboy fans and who are in despair to eat away our sorrows uh, on the Super Bowl once again. And so the way it is, is we just make your pots of chili or uh, a special side and we have kind of a competition and somehow we worship with the smells of chili all around us. And then afterwards we eat and it's a fundraiser for our youth as they get ready for their mission trips this summer. And it's a lot of fun. I encourage you to come. It's just a blast uh, to get to share them together. And so look forward to that on February 11th. And so, uh, but man, I'm grateful you're here. Uh, man, my, I hope you've been encouraged and I hope the Lord has put a conviction on our hearts as we think about our stories, those monumental stories that are like of just God's faithfulness in our life. And I hope that we walk out of here saying, God, I'm willing to tell the story. When the opportunities and maybe the people who need to hear are presented, I'll tell the story uh, as just a witness to your goodness. And so let us be the church that's willing to tell the story. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.